All right, wonderful. First question we have is from J.R. Sedivi. In reference to slide seven, certain countries have near real-time payment systems, aka faster payments in the UK, but the US lags substantially behind. The question is, how fast are the near-time payment systems, UK, i.e. UK, and are such speeds available for international transactions as well? Are the US payment system significantly slower than a typical transaction? And if so, why has the US not adopted the faster model that's in the UK? Okay, so that's a multi-part question and we will deal with each part individually. Um, US does tend to run one to three day for ACH and then wire transfers, which are a more expensive mechanism, 15 to $25 per transaction, uh, do sometimes go same day or next day. Um, but ACH, which is the realistic, uh, from a cost-wise perspective, day-to-day -day payment system, does tend to run one to three days. Faster Payments is a domestic-only system in the UK, and it tends to be uh, as little as less than an hour, sometimes even faster than that, one or two minutes. The difference is that the UK mandated faster payments. Uh, and push the banks to do that. In the US, they have been talking about doing a faster payments system of some type for many, 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 many years. But since it's an industry consortium type initiative that everyone has to agree to do it, in particular the large money center banks, uh, they have not come to agreement to do it. Some people believe, suggest, think that this has to do with um, them not wanting to take on new costs, build new systems, spend money in order to come up with a more efficient system that might reduce their revenues from things like wire transfers. So right now there's basically a two-track system in the United States. If you want something to get there quickly, you're going to be using a wire transfer that is much more expensive. If you're looking for a slower mechanism, ACH is much less expensive. If you had a much less expensive quick system, uh, you might run into issues in terms of lost revenue from the banks. So increasing investment in order to have less revenue does not appear something that the banks have moved to voluntarily. Uh, in the UK where it was mandated and they put it together and it works that way. I believe Germany has a similar system but a lot of countries do not. It does not apply to international transfers. These are all domestic systems. He also asked, can you elaborate on this question? Does the user own the coins in this case or is it a claim against the company? And the context is in regard to fully hosted wallets, and then he links it to, in a traditional bank, does the depositor own the fiat or is it simply a claim against the bank? This is an excellent, excellent, excellent question, a source of great confusion for a lot of people. Let's start with the traditional system, describe what it is, and then describe how that might apply in the Bitcoin world. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that deposits in a bank are somehow an asset of the bank and the way they get to that mistake is they imagine that they're going to the bank with a bunch of cash and then they're putting it in like a safe and so that's something valuable so something's an asset and there there's now this greater thing of value at the bank this is incorrect a deposit in a bank is a liability to the bank is money that they owe you, they owe it to you, the depositor, because you have lent it to them. That's why they pay interest rate on those deposits to you. So the way the mechanics work, you lend money to a bank, they owe it to you and they pay you a certain interest rate. The bank then takes that money, lends it out to other people at a higher interest rate, and so the difference between those two is known as the net interest margin. And if you truly compare this to a traditional company, bank financial statements, 
start with a net interest margin, it's the equivalent of the gross margin in a manufacturing company, and then they have all their sales, general, and administrative costs. So what it means when you're a depositor at Citibank, you do not have a specific claim to a specific asset, to a specific fiat, oh, here are my $20 that I gave you. You are a creditor to Citibank. The worst part is you're actually a fairly, you're fairly low down in the creditor structure with the exception of the deposit guarantee. So most countries have a deposit guarantee of around $100,000 or euros. It varies by country, but most developed countries are in that range. And that is guaranteed by the government or a, or a industry organization like the FDIC that is in effect guaranteed by the government. So that money has a third party or external guarantee. But after that, you're an unsecured creditor of the bank. Um, in fact, it's conceivable that there are other creditors who are secured creditors who have actual assets of the bank attached to their loans. Let's say I have lent the bank money to build a bank branch who would actually appear ahead of you in the capital structure. So you would get paid after the secured creditors, after the, after the preferred creditors, you would get paid before the shareholders. So, and we saw an example of this in Cyprus last year when there were losses uh, beyond the deposit limits and the banks had used up, they had already defaulted in effect on their lenders, the other creditors, and then the only way they could make their books balance is they had to default to their depositors. And uh, Popular Bank, which was the one that was in the worst shape of all, actually defaulted completely above the 100,000 euro uh, deposit insurance limit. And so if you had a million euros in Popular Bank last February, after the a uh, haircut, your bank account had 100,000 euros. And if you had 110,000 euros, you had 100,000 euros. If you had 20 million euros, as some people in fact did, you once again had 100,000. Because this is when you discover you don't own some euro notes that are somehow in the bank, in the bank cellar. You actually just have, you've lent money to Leggy, um, and when they don't have the money to pay you back, you're actually taking on some credit risk and risk of default. So this is how it works in traditional banking. And one of the very interesting questions is, how would this work for a hosted wallet like Coinbase? Um, I don't think it has been tested in case law yet. Do you actually own the specific coins that you've deposited, my guess is in fact you don't. What you actually are is a creditor of Coinbase. And if Coinbase had a hacking attack and some of their coins were lost or took, their, took the money and spent it on something else or otherwise was failed to meet their business obligations and could not meet all their different business obligations, you'd probably have to stand in line with other creditors to get your coins back. And you would get your coin by getting your coins back, uh, that means just the dollar value of what Coinbase owes you. So that is the major issue a lot of people have with hosted wallets. Um, you know, on the plus side, they're very convenient. They take away a lot of the security work that you'd have to do to keep your own wallet, they're more consumer friendly. But on the flip side, if the theory of Bitcoin for some was not just faster transactions and what have you, but the ability to control and hold your own assets to the degree that they're in a hosted wallet, you're not really doing that anymore. You don't necessarily have control of specific Bitcoins on the blockchain. What you really are is a creditor of Coinbase. And if something went wrong with Coinbase, you'd have to stand in line. You know, we saw this in full effect with Mt. Gox. So I think that's uh, how it would play out in a bankruptcy of a hosted 
wallet provider. Then, okay, I'm moving to a question from Gabor. How does a Bitcoin processor like BitPay works? How do they set the currency rate? How many confirmations must the merchant wait for? The, the first question is very interesting. How do they set the currency rate? I believe it is not particularly transparent right now. I believe there are there is some margin being captured by the payment processor in what rate it gives the consumer. So I once did a transaction to test this. I paid a Coinbase, a BitPay hosted invoice using a Coinbase wallet just to see what would happen. And the, there was absolutely an exchange rate mismatch. And so it was, I don't know, let's say it was a $100 invoice. Um, the number of Bitcoins that BitPay calculated I needed to clear the $100 invoice came out to be on the Coinbase side, I don't know, $102. So there is absolutely some discretion that they're using there on the consumer side. I suspect they are subsidizing uh, to a large degree um, the cost of operations and the lower payment processing fees through this margin. Now, it's interesting if you're thinking about the traditional credit card processing world, what you should compare it to. In a domestic transaction, so if you're a US cardholder buying something in dollars, you are, this issue doesn't exist. And you're not in additionally taking on an exchange rate charge. If you're transacting with foreign currency though, so if you take your Chase MasterCard and take it to Paris and spend in Paris, depending on the card you have, but on most cards, it is likely that you will pay a 2 to 3% fee. It's likely you won't have perfect transparency on the exchange rate used. And it's likely the merchant processor might also charge some type of fee to the merchant. So it kind of looks and feels and smells right now to be similar to the process used for international credit card payments. Uh, in terms of confirmations, uh, from what I know of BitPay, they consider the transaction finally done at six confirmations, um, just like most people do. However, given that most of these transactions are done for online merchants, the merchant can more or less say, yep, you're good to go and then well before they ship, they have an opportunity to um, review, you review the transaction. Let me take a second and look at the comments. Right, I'm going to reply to a comment that Nels has brought up. I believe, and correct me, Nels, if I'm wrong in the chat window. You're talk when you're talking about the 15% uh, discount at Amazon. Uh, it's you're talking about something like Purse.io, and if so, I think what's happening there, it's in effect acting as an intermediary to people who want to buy bitcoins in other countries where they don't have access to an exchange and there you're picking up the discount so to speak from someone willing to pay more for your bitcoins than the market price um, it's certainly not that amazon has 15 percent margins to give away and it's certainly not the case that the payment processor have 15 percent margins to give away uh, it's an interesting concept. It feels a little bit like a hack to me, and I wonder what ends up happening with that type of thing from an AML anti-money laundering perspective. This is this is an issue that happens a lot with, let's say, 
gift cards. So people invent a new service, they say, oh, I will uh, sell gift cards for cash or gift cards for Bitcoins. And if it's a individual who's doing this for the first time and doesn't understand the business, all of a sudden they think they're growing very well. There's a lot of demand and interest in their business, but it is often used. These are well-known channels to be used for money laundering. And so without the proper procedures in place, these types of companies can get in trouble. By the way, George just chatted me that BitPay is itself taking the risk of double spending and has not yet received a double spend as far as he knows, which is very, very interesting. I was looking at their API reference. They do still have a six they, they do talk about a six confirmation uh, to be fully confirmed, but George believes that they're, they're actually taking on the risk. So that's a very, that's a very interesting point. Um, let me take a short break. Any questions on the topics we've discussed so far? like to talk about a couple of things that I'm seeing right now in New York that might be of interest and might be very relevant uh, to this topic. Um, three weeks ago I was in a meeting with one of the very very well-known exchanges um, I can't say which one which was talking about what's going to happen over the next six months in New York. You know, fingers crossed, etc., etc. And there is a lot of momentum right now and the New York, New York State has been surprisingly positive about setting up a formal process and a former formal licensure process for, let's call them, institutional grade exchanges. And when I say institutional grade exchanges, what do I mean by that? I do not believe that the average, let's say, large asset manager, large investment bank, could use one of the existing exchanges and still stay within their parameters of their risk management procedures, their counterparty risk procedures, and so on. And part of that is a regulatory issue. Is it clear what the regulations are to handle these in the United States and in New York State? And part of it is the counterparty risk and security of the exchange. Um, what looks to be the case is that there will be one or two of these that are launched within the end of 14. Now again, it might not, it might not happen, um, but it does appear very promising uh, ben Losky's office has been extremely helpful uh, to folks in this regard. And you will see things like requirements of how much assets these exchanges need to hold as a reserve. You will see, and we're now talk, we will see things in the range of tens and tens of millions of dollars in assets that they have to hold as security in order to participate uh, and be uh, an exchange of this type. So one of the things that I'm most excited about, most interested in seeing or in the development of Bitcoin over the next six to 12 months is if it can make the leap to this institutional grade platform. That's going to create a lot of side benefits that I believe are tremendously underestimated. Right now, one of the issues that causes a lot of anxiety to people outside the Bitcoin ecosystem is both the volatility of Bitcoin and both the uh, the spreads. And so when you have a mark, an exchange market like Bitcoin is today, by traditional financial services standards, it's really tiny. I mean, there's no other way to describe it. We maybe are talking about a hundred million dollars of daily trading, maybe. 
and the traditional foreign exchange markets are in the five trillion dollar range and the traditional foreign exchange markets are the most liquid tightest spread markets on the planet there's no other commodity that is traded that heavily that has so many participants that has so much liquidity that trades 24 7 and what that does is it provides a base of low spread transactions and relatively non-volatile transactions that you can build the whole remaining global international payments financial infrastructure on top of at the very very biggest players spreads on foreign currency are measured in single basis points so the basis point is one ten thousandth so this is something that's not yet the case today in bitcoin um, if you try to buy or sell 10 20 30 million dollars of bitcoin in an afternoon you would create tremendous price mo price movement on any of the current exchanges uh, we saw a great example of this with the Marshall's sale of the seized bitcoins from Bit Road, uh, from Silk Road. It was the price has not been revealed. Tim Draper bought them, but it is believed to have been significantly above the market price. Now you can say, well, why would someone pay significantly above the market price? And the reason is that they did not believe that you could buy twenty million dollars worth of bitcoins on the publicly traded markets without moving the price against them, uh, pushing the price up and end up paying more than what is quote unquote the market price. Well, $20 million is a big number for Bitcoin. It is a tiny number in international commerce. It's one transaction. And so for Bitcoin to reach its full potential, for Bitcoin to be able to transact large amounts of value for Bitcoin to be able to transact with lower end-to-end -end fees, which include the spreads, this has to be corrected. And I believe we're on a good pathway to do that. And I believe what's going to happen once you have platforms that can support institutional grade investors, you will start getting a whole new class of people coming into the market to trade Bitcoin to and from sovereign currencies. And while some people, particularly in the tech industry, say, oh, this is bad, these are speculators, we don't want them, I think they're actually extremely useful and helpful because in aggregate, they cancel each other out. But when you have buyers and sellers in these markets, it becomes, and much more transaction volume, it becomes much easier and more realistic to be able to trade in and out yourself without impacting the market at lower spreads and so with lower end-to-end -end fees for Bitcoin transactions. Barry Silbert of Second Market has stated that he estimates that it is about there's about half a billion to a billion dollars of institutional money that is sitting on the sidelines waiting for uh, what they would consider an institutional grade exchange to emerge so they can start putting money uh, into Bitcoin investment and Bitcoin trading. So I think we are looking at pretty exciting times on the financial services infrastructure starting to get built out. And as that does, some of the other issues will diminish in importance. Um, one thing that you see is I've asked myself, what are, what is the finan what are the key financial service infrastructure pieces we need. One is exchanges, one is developed merchant processors, and one is easy to use, secure, safe consumer wallets. Those three things are the building blocks for everything else. It allows consumers to get in and out of Bitcoin at a reasonable cost. It allows consumers to hold their Bitcoins in a manner that's safe and secure. And it allows merchants to start accepting Bitcoin without having to do um, all the integration work themselves. And I think we have excellent starting points in all these things. Uh, Coinbase, BitPay are, have done amazing work over the last year and a half, but 
they're still tiny in traditional terms. I mean, you're still talking about 50, 60,000 merchants among them or in the traditional payment networks or in the 20 million plus. Uh, we talked a little bit about the exchange and the wallets are, you know, it really is like the internet in the early 90s. There's the estimates vary, but there's three to five million, that's, that's the estimates are three to five million consumer wallet accounts. It depends what you assume are duplicates and what have you. And they're still, from a end consumer perspective, a little clunky. I mean, it is possible to screw up. I have had, I had a friend of mine fell for a phishing attack a couple months ago and lost thirty thousand dollars in one of the major wallets that you've everyone has heard of. I won't name it, but everyone has heard of it. So, once as those pieces evolve and the underlying infrastructure gets more easier to use and more uh, more cost effective then it really starts to make the promise of everything Bitcoin can be uh, come closer and closer and I my estimate is that for the foreseeable future it is still going to be relevant what the total costs are to start in sovereign currency make a transaction in Bitcoin and then end back in a sovereign currency. And that's where the exchanges and the liquidity become really important because there's no doubt Bitcoin to Bitcoin transactions, Bitcoin only transactions are immensely cost effective. However, I don't think the average company and a lot of consumers will live solely in Bitcoin right now. It's too volatile. Um, they have obligations in that are denominated in sovereign currencies. And so the end-to-end -end costs matter. And for a consumer, the end-to-end -end costs right now are still, you add them all together, they're still starting to border on what it costs to transact in the traditional system. And quite frankly, in the traditional system, those costs are often hidden from consumers charged to the merchants and then buried in the product price. So someone says, well, wait a second, I, I spend with my Amex, point, my Amex card, it costs me nothing, I get free mileage points, so I'm actually making money when I spend money on my Amex card. Instead, if I want to go buy some Bitcoins, I might pay between half a percentage and one percentage to buy them, and then if I somehow need them to take them back into dollars, I might pay another fee to take them back to dollars well this looks like it's more expensive and then it's not even clear what my exchange rate is from bitcoins to dollars when i'm buying something so this is it's you can see it coming but it still has work ahead of it and i i think the next two or three years are going to be a lot of underlying infrastructure and as that infrastructure um gets put into place then all the higher order stuff uh, comes in place. You know, you can see the same, you can see the same model in remittances. If I'm just going to continue a little bit on my monologue for a second. If I'm thinking about, you know, would you, would I build a remittance, Bitcoin remittances firm? I'm not sure such a thing is going to exist in the long run, because really you can do Bitcoin remittances once you have consumer wallets that are well accepted and easy to use and once you have liquid exchanges in each currency zone and each currency pair. So if I want to go US to Philippines or US to Nigeria, I need to be able to take dollars because I'm likely still paid in dollars, convert them to Bitcoins. Once I have them in Bitcoins, I don't really need an intermediary. I can just send it directly to someone in the Philippines. But then for the foreseeable future, that person in the Philippines, if they have to pay their rent, probably is not going to be able to pay them in Bitcoins. And it'll change bit by bit, but not overnight. So then they need an exchange in the Philippines that can convert back into the local currency. And so these, those, and once that infrastructure is in place, and eventually it will be, 
the concept of a money trans uh, a remittance provider itself a little odd that doesn't not sure it really needs to exist it existed before because you couldn't throw fiat or sovereign currency across borders uh, not without some intermediary infrastructure with Bitcoin you don't need that but what you do still need are the hooks to the existing financial system and those will be I think developed uh, over time and you know it will be it's it's exactly one of those things that will be faster it'll take it'll be slower than we think in the short term but faster than we think in the long term. and you see this in a lot of you know the internet seemed a little bit niche a little bit like a toy for quite some time and then in year 10 to 20 it turns out to just take off and i think we'll see some of the th same things here but it will take time i mean i it's i find it shocking that the average number of non-cash transactions in places like china are still five or six per person per year that includes everything wire transfers checks credit cards everything's not cash it's a handful per year so the dominant payment mechanism in retail today not by dollar volume but in re number of transactions is still good old-fashioned cash even though we've had credit cards for 30 40 50 years so we've had checks for hundreds of years but still cash is the dominant and you know some countries are much further along the u.s it's stats aren't like this but globally the dominant mechanism is still cash which is fascinating even we don't think of it that way and so the life cycles will be long I, when I think about Bitcoin, I have my 20-year hat on, not my two-year hat on. But it will look like a very different system at the end. Um, JR asks, is there a risk that regulators will force remittance providers on the B2C ecos BTC ecosystem for lack of understanding? So far, no regulator has claimed the right or in shown interest in regulating person-to-person -person Bitcoin transactions. So if I have a Bitcoin and I want to send it to my wife and my wife today happens to be in London and I happen to be in Cyprus, pretty much all the regulators have done so far, that's fine. We don't consider that a financial services company and we'll talk about that a lot more in the next session where we talk about regulation because the uh, the US has the most well-developed rules on this topic and it's been fairly clear that that's not something they would consider that they ought to regulate however if I said hey I'm gonna open a shop here in my office in Cyprus people start showing up with euros I turn them into bitcoins and send them to their cousin in London well I look like a money transmitter in traditional terms that looks like something that might create opportunity for money laundering um, and the regulators will come say you've got to register you've got to follow rules you have to keep records you have to tell us who you took the money from and who you sent it to and the whole infrastructure but I think person-to-person -person transactions are going to stay unregulated and I think for by virtue of the fact that they also be very 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 difficult to regulate um, if I send something to George it'd be pretty hard to be chasing down individual transactions if I set up a shop and a sign and say I'm turning turning euros to bitcoins I'd be much I'll be much easier to find I'll be much easier to regulate any questions on these topics I think somewhere, George, I think when I logged in and out of chat, there were some questions about fractional banking that um, I lost when I came back to the chat. And could you copy and paste those to me, uh, either in the chat or in the Skype? Yeah, George points out uh, when they were working in Cyprus, they asked regulation, they couldn't get it. I think you're, you're going to see in the EU you're not going to see a ton of 
regulation at the country level until, particularly from the central banks, until there's broader guidance uh, from the ECB system as a whole. Uh, we had spoken to the Central Bank of Cyprus as well as the university about this topic, and they basically said, we're waiting to see what the ECB wants to do uh, system-wide. Oh, okay, great. How could, here are the additional questions from earlier. How will Bitcoin lending proceed? Will fraction money creation start inside the Bitcoin paradigm? There is, well, there is no reason why one couldn't create a bank that accepts Bitcoin deposits and then fractionally lends them out. Now, you're going to say the same Bitcoin moves, yeah, but you, you fractionally reserve it. Like, you know, you're not keeping all the same number of Bitcoins on hand. And so, but I think that would, in effect, be regulated as a bank under traditional standards. And I think it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, I don't see that being area of anyone who's being focused on. It's not filling any need that's not being met. Kind of mismatches with what the, you know, the rest of the parts of the ecosystem are doing. But there's no reason it could not theoretically be done. I mean, that's what Mt. Gox did, in effect. You know, just did it in an unregulated and collapsing manner. Because when you were a Mt. Gox customer, you thought you had Bitcoins. What you actually had was a line in the Mt. Gox database saying you have X Bitcoins, but that bit, those Bitcoins were not there. Right? So it's a similar model. And, you know, you go deposit cash at the bank. They're not... The cash they can lend out isn't just the cash that you give them, they just lend it out in cash. So this is, it could, ha it could happen, if it happens, it's really just a bank. If it's a bank, it's something that is going to be regulated as a bank. And it's not sure, clear to me what particular advantages there are in doing this in Bitcoin. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, I don't think there's going to be much movement on this in the interim. Um, but I don't know what the second question is. Is the convenience factor for Bitcoin simply a technology fix that can work around current payment systems? I, so that could be clarified in the chat. That would be helpful. I don't know what that means. And then the question is, can we not hedge against Bitcoin volatility using euro, dollar, and pound. Well, it's hard to do it directly. I mean, the volatility is in its ratio of euro, dollar. It's its, it's relationship to the euro, the dollar, and the pound. So, you know, things that will reduce volatility will be more trading in the market and a futures market so people can buy and sell ahead. And there's some, there's three or four firms that are doing Bitcoin derivatives right now, but they're still very early. They're still very mature. They still don't have a lot of liquidity. As these things emerge, you will um, you will see that become. I think you will see the volatility diminish, but it's going to take it's going to take time. We're still an immature. Uh, we're still a quite immature asset class. Uh, still a small asset class. And until there's a robust set of traders in there, uh, I think the volatility will be there. I suspect, here's my little prediction for five years from now. I don't know how many of you have ever read the book Liar's Poker by Michael Lewis. And it was, it is a story primarily at about the beginning of mortgage-backed securities, which were founded at Solomon Brothers in the early 80s and were viewed as a joke initially within Solomon Brothers. Um, hard to model, weird, not prestigious. So some sales and traders, not particularly in the core of the bank, got a hold of this and started trading these and became the first to understand how to value them and trade them. In the beginning, because the market was highly inefficient, they were big spreads, 
they made a lot of money and and eventually became very very powerful in Solomon Brothers and um, makes for a very colorful book. I believe the same thing will happen with Bitcoin trading that today it is primarily ignored on in kind of Main Street Wall in kind of the center of Wall Street but someone once the institutional frameworks in place someone will say wow here is a liquid market with large spreads to a sales and trader that looks like an opportunity to make money and so in their own self-interest they will come in they will start to trade and as more and more of them come in it actually works really nicely because it will dampen the volatility it will dampen the spreads i think on this topic you know Adam Smith and supply and demand and people's incentives will actually help the, the volatility. Um, it, is, <clears throat> it is interesting, most of my professional network in New York is in financial services and quite sophisticated in financial services. For the most part, Bitcoin is still viewed as a curiosity which is interesting to see. There's been a little bit of movement over the last six to nine months, but I would say for every 20 people I have a serious discussion with about it, one or two or three get seriously engaged. The most of folks who are working in traditional financial services are still somewhere between, I'm not sure I understand it, I don't have time to understand it right now, to rolling their eyeballs a little bit. So that is very typical. Uh, I use the same model you saw when people were talking about voice over IP and the telecoms. So we have all these great fixed lines and we'd never need that low quality, weird voice over IP stuff. It's a very common reaction by the incumbent and I think, interestingly, a bullish sign of what's yet to come. We're still very, very early in terms of financial services adoption. The largest Bitcoin financial service firms on any metric you want to count them on are tiny, 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 tiny versus the traditional financial services industry, which is mentioned in the PowerPoint, is the most profitable industry in the world. So things that would look like gigantic outcomes in the Bitcoin ecosystem are kind of a blip in the bucket in the traditional financial services world. So. I think about merchant processing in this regard. Will you, what, do, how do I expect merchant processing to play out? I think the current merchant processors, the, the big, uh, the first pays of the world, the uh, chase payment tech, what have you, will sit back. They'll also maybe say negative things about Bitcoin. Chase, which has a very large payments business, is extremely negative publicly on Bitcoin. Jamie Dimon. All, going all the way up to Jamie Dimon, and they will just try and delay the evolution. One day BitPay or Coinbase gets big enough that it can't be ignored, which will happen, then these will become acquisition targets and they will say, okay, I guess we have to bite the bullet now and spend one billion or two billion dollars to add this to our merchant processing platform. But, you know, one billion, two billion dollars to the banks on the payment processing side is it's not that much money. You know, they're regularly writing checks for regulatory fines in the five and ten billion dollar range. So we are right, you know, not exactly at the beginning. If it was a baseball game, maybe we're at the end of the first inning. Or somewhere like that in the financial services world and its approach to Bitcoin. And I think the next 18 months is going to proceed very, very rapidly, particularly for me, it is a key marker will be if an institutional grade exchange opens in New York. Once you have that, it will make it real to a large, a much larger financial services audience. People will start interacting with it more and then you'll see all the other pieces start to follow on from that.
Any questions on what we've covered? We have about five minutes, so let me give a last opportunity for any specific financial services questions. If not, we can wrap it up in a couple minutes. We have two questions that popped up. Uh, let me answer George's first. So which space in the financial services industry would you advise someone to build a business in the Bitcoin space? Well, I can tell you the one that I wouldn't advise building, which is a remittances Western Union style business, because I think it's one that, you know, in time might just be eliminated completely by the other areas. The two obvious ones that are also for big investors are exchanges and merchant processors. We're going to require at least one or two scaled institutional exchanges per currency. So that means the US is going to need a couple, the Eurozone is going to need a couple, and then any other place that allows them is going to need a couple, whether it's the Philippines, Brazil, Russia, which is starting to soften up a little bit on Bitcoin, India, which is not yet really softened up. All of these are going to need scaled up institutional grade exchanges. This is not for the solo entrepreneur. These are businesses that are going to need tens of millions of dollars in funding to get off the ground. They are going to have huge regulatory requirements. They're going to have regulatory capital requirements. but and these are going to be a winner-take-all type businesses. So the exchanges tend to consolidate. The places that have more liquidity have uh, they get more liquidity, and so the number one exchange is going to be worth in the U.S. is going to be worth billions. The number five exchange might not be worth very much at all. But I don't think the winners have yet been determined, and they certainly have not been determined worldwide across currency zones. So if I think about who is going to have successful, successful outcomes five to ten years from now of people who have started Bitcoin companies, you will see a dozen exchanges be winners across major currency zones. That's one bucket. Second, I think the merchant processor business is still very, very early. It is true there are two big competitors. Uh, BitPay and Coinbase, but merchant processing tends to be a sales and marketing type business where acquiring the underlying merchant is the hard part and it just takes time. And so right now the two main ones still have a fraction of the market they need to ultimately get. So there will be opportunities both across geography and across industry for people who focus. So even though there's a couple of fairly big competitors going in the U.S., there's still lots of opportunity in the U.S. And then think about the rest of the world. Is someone really pushing hard in merchant processing in Italy, in Brazil, in Japan, in Greece? No, not really. And so this looks like it's going to have an evolution along the lines of a lot of other e-commerce categories like flash sales, where you see different firms, different geographies, everyone running to scale up and copy each other, and then in time they consolidate. That one is going to have fewer individual winners. It's not going to, it's, sorry, it'll be less consolidated in terms of the winners. So it's not a winner-take-all market. You can expect that multiple 
merchant processors will exist in the big countries and certainly merchant processor winners will exist in the smaller countries as well and then at some point they probably get acquired and get consolidated into a broader system so those two are the completely super obvious ones but also are not small easy businesses to build uh, you need a full-blown management team you need institutional level financing and it is it's going to be a fairly big boy type game if you're thinking then about okay what comes beyond that I think the bucket you then fall into one of two buckets and again it has to do with how much capital and how much financial and regulatory experience you have I think there are going to be all types of interesting well let me take the financial services side if you want to build financial services types of products that are not exchanges or um, or merchant processors you're still likely to come across AML KYC type regulation it's still likely to be a somewhat sensitive field so you're still probably looking at some type of venture capital financing or fairly large personal financing and people who know their way around these laws um, I imagine in time we will replicate a lot of parts of the financial services system with again the exchanges being the base for that to work well and cost effectively and efficiently but you can just kind of go go all the way through the financial services industry map and see things that can be filled in I mean you're seeing it in asset management right now with things like second market and the Winklevi ETF but even though these might not have quite as large capital requirements as merchant processors and um, exchanges they're still non-trivial you're still talking millions to get off the ground if you're a smaller business if you're a smaller entrepreneur then I would look for things that you can do with the blockchain that aren't a replication of a financial services business so uh, these don't touch upon uh, the regulators they will look much more like traditional series a or angel investment startups where a lot of things ought to be thrown against the wall a lot of them will fail but there will be some interesting winners emerge from that and the nice part is you can innovate fairly openly if you're not touching against the financial services regulators so you know there's a lot of pushback against the regulators but they're going to exist in financial service they're not going to exist in everything else a good example of something of what, like what I'm talking about is proofofexistence.com that was done by a developer part-time and it is a way to put the hash of a contract into the blockchain and charge a small fee for that service that's the type of thing that under no circumstance can any financial regulator invent a reason why they would want to regulate that and so there that those areas you'll see much more the spirit of internet based businesses where two guys in a garage can throw out ideas so where you are around my, anything in the area of micropayments microtransactions um, automated payments payments for software agencies for robots things of that nature it has a lot of other data you can put in the blockchain all that whole area I think we're just at the beginning of the beginning and I'd love to see more work happening in those areas as opposed to just oh let's try and replicate everything in financial services I mean, that's going to happen as well but this is where we can start doing things that you just can't do in the traditional system you know I would love every day I run into some site like the Telegraph where I want to read an article and they want to charge me you know, nine euros to sign up for the month and I'm saying well, I'm not going to read this every month I don't want to pay nine euros but if I could affect the time and cost effectively pay 15 cents maybe I would pay that for the article so this is if you're a small if you have a small amount of funding if you're an individual entrepreneur or a couple of programmers I would think about what usage cases 
have never existed in the traditional financial services world because they could not actually be done. And that I, we're really, really, really at the beginning. We're at the, you know, we're in the early 90s where we're still working on getting our modems online and Snapchat is 20 years away. So I think you'll have infinite, almost an infinite number of things that will emerge in those regards. So to summarize my question, the completely obvious ones, the ones that will be big winners, but are for large investors are going to be exchanges and merchant processors. I think other parts of the financial services world will follow. But again, I think you're looking at fairly well capitalized companies. And then I'd encourage individual entrepreneurs to look for things to do that aren't financial services, but use the blockchain. Uh, we will do one more I have one more question about an insurance contract. It's a form of currency. Um, I'm not sure exactly understand the question from Alfred. Let me just talk briefly about insurance. Insurance, um, it's really I don't think the unit of account that is used for insurance is particularly important, right? What matters is insurance in insurance are two aspects, neither one of which have to do with the currency. One is underwriting skills. So when someone comes to you and says, I would like to insure this risk, and the risk is that my house on this river will flood or that I will die before age 65 there it has almost nothing to do with financial services per se it's all do you have the right data and judgment and models to predict the likelihood of this happening so you can correctly estimate the risk of this happening um, so that you can price the contract correctly the other side of that is investing capabilities because what happens is with insurance you the insurance company is paid in advance and has to pay back later so this is the legendary insurance float that Warren Buffett has used his whole life. And Warren Buffett has been superb at taking that float, investing it in high return investments and generating an, uh, a profit on those investments. His company has also been very good at underwriting as well. He's often generated an underwriting profit in areas where people never have. And so in insurance, at least in traditional insurance, I'm not sure exactly what benefits Bitcoin would bring because the skill sets there really have not that much to do with the underlying currency. It's just that I, and I haven't thought about this deeply, I'll be honest, but that's kind of my first assessment of it. All right, everyone, I think we are, we're at we're six minutes past, so we will wrap up the session. Thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. It is always interesting and challenging, and I learn something new every time we do one of these things. So we will see you next time for regulation.